you. Thank you for your invitation here uh, this morning. Um, I will try to, to stick to the 20 minutes, knowing that with 20 minutes it's very difficult to speak about what is happening in the Middle East and uh, in MENA and Middle East and the African countries, and, and then we'll have your questions, and I think through your question we can go deeper in the, the discussion. Um, I, I wrote a book which has been published already in French, and it's going to be published in, in next month, in fact, in, in, uh, in, by Penguin in English, which is The Arab Awakening, Islam and the New Middle East. And it's really about what is happening, but beyond what is happening, the deep questions and the important questions for the, the, the Muslim-majority countries uh, in, the, in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, as to their future and in which way things could evolve. The first thing that I would question when we speak about what is happening, and I know that uh, sometimes when I, I, I have been visiting uh, many Arab countries these last uh, months, I'm questioning the way we name what is happening. I'm not talking about revolutions, and I'm not talking about Arab Spring, because I still don't know what is really happening, so I'm talking about Arab uprisings and awakening, not more, not less. But if I have to discuss what is happening in the Middle East and in North Africa, the only country where I can say something is happening which apparently is good is Tunisia today, where things are moving slowly. But I wouldn't say that uh, the other uprisings, I'm very worried about what is happening in Egypt today, very worried about what is happening in Libya, and in uh, Yemen, as much also as in Bahrain. We don't talk about Bahrain because it seems to be far, it's a petrol monarchy. But if the, 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 the movements were to, uh, uh, something would have happened there, the whole situation for the other petrol monarchies would have been very, very difficult. And, and, and now it's not. It's still, we are still dealing with repression. And it's also the case in Syria. Um, what also it's important for me, it's not to be naive about uh, what happened before. So I took some time, and I, I'm still talking about this, about uh, what happened and to understand what are the causes of what happened. And I think that there is something which is, we were talking about uh, uh, people uh, uh, demonstrating after the, the, the uh, self-formulation of uh, Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, and all this was Right, these were, these were facts. And uh, uh, the price, you know, the bread price and the social uh, economic realities in the country, all the ingredients in Tunisia were there to have such a uh, 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 mobilization and demonstrations against the dictatorship. And this is not, this cannot be controlled, and this came from the people. While at the same time, what we need to know, and these are things that are clear in the necessity for the Americans and for the European countries to change their policy in the region is something which was known, it was not, uh, it was not new. When in 2003, the President uh, 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 Bush was, say, was explaining what was happening in Iraq as the beginning of the process toward democratization of the, 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 the region, he was saying something which was important in the American strategy. And there is something which is known today about the training of bloggers, cyber dissidents towards non-violent mobilization. That's not new. I, I came with all the facts, and this was this is we know now there is this cyber dissident organization in the States that they had many meetings. And even in 2008, the, Amer the American ambassador sending a message to the State Department saying they are young mobilizing now and going through a, a, a process of uh, uh, acting and demonstrating, and their objective is to throw away the current government, and they were talking about September, before September 2011. So the point for me is that the ingredients for the people to act against the government and to say no to dictators and to corrupt regimes was there, while I don't think that the West didn't know that this something was, ha was happening. I don't buy this at all. Because I heard about it before, because we have the facts and we have uh, uh, even, and it's not only WikiLeaks, it's also people working foreign affairs uh, newspaper uh, papers, and, and we have these facts written. And, and, and for me, it's important why. 
Because when it comes to the Middle East, we have to avoid only thinking about the political dimension and thinking, oh, these are people for democracy. No, we are dealing with socio-economic factors, that's true, but we are dealing with geostrategy and we are dealing with economic factors. And I think that this is also quite important in all the new dimensions that are uh, taking place in the region. So I am not, I don't want to be only obsessed with, oh, it's a question of democracy. Let us ask ourselves, are the Islamists ready for democracy? And by the way, I liked something that I heard by uh, the personal advisor uh, uh, to the, prime, the Turkish prime minister when we were in the meeting with the Alliance of Civilization saying, the question might be not if the Arabs are ready for democracy, but is the West ready for the Arabs experiencing democracy? Uh, which is a good one. Uh, so I think that we, have to, we, we, we need to have a comprehensive approach when it comes to, uh, uh, to this and, and, and to get the socioeconomic factors right that they were uh, the ingredients in Egypt, in Tunisia, and in other countries, um, but also the socio-economic, uh, the, the, the geostrategic realities and the economic dimensions. Now, if I want to add a few things about what we knew, uh, uh, it's also two things that were quite important with the dictatorships in the region. We knew, and this was known, and for the last uh, five years, for example, in Tunisia, the American administration was in touch with uh, uh, the opposition and with the, with the Islamists, and also European countries. Not uh, directly there, but uh, we know today that they are very often meeting in Qatar, they are meeting in other places, but this relationship is not new. So the West dealing with Islamists and talking to them, knowing, trying to know what they want and what is the future is something which is important. And there was something which was clear is that the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia was an old regime and the future was problematic. So the transition was problematic, exactly the same way as Egypt. And we heard that uh, uh, the president uh, 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 Mubarak was thinking about his son, Gamal. And Gamal was uh, taking over 60% of the great businesses and enterprises in Egypt and starting to go towards East, dealing with the Chinese which also it's a question in the region about the new actors. You can't get the right understanding of what is happening in the Middle East if you don't uh, uh, take into account the new actors in the region. And China and Russia, as much as Brazil, South Africa, and mainly, of course, China. China, over the last 10 years, uh, 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 multiplied by seven its commercial relationship with the region. They are everywhere. And the point is that when China is in the Middle East, the perception of, for example, some of the, the, the important dimensions in the Middle East, and, 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 and uh, let us start with the Israeli Palestinian conflict, it's completely different. China has not the same take on the conflict as the Americans and the Europeans. And these are things that we have to take into account in the evolution. And we can't speak about democratic processes in the region if we forget the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have to get it right. It's in the middle of uh, many of the questions that we have now, but not only. But I want to put this as something which is a more comprehensive uh, uh, dimension. And as much as I agree with the fact that we can speak about the domino effect when it came to Tunisia and then Egypt and then Yemen and other countries, I think that when it comes to politics and when it comes to so socio uh, uh, geostrategic interests, is much more a chess game than a, a domino effect. It's, it's really that we have to take every country and to try to understand where uh, it sits in the whole, in the whole picture. Now, the second point, which is important, so, so the first is this one, is the dictatorships were in a, a, a crisis and they were, we, are, we were facing a transitory period. How this could uh, be uh, uh, controlled or this could be, uh, uh, um, how we can go along the whole process was a question that we have uh, in the West, but also, uh, um, in the Middle East itself. The second point is all these young uh, uh, people who are using the uh, 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 internet and uh, uh, social network and all this, the point is, and we saw this with the election, they were very powerful against 
but they didn't have a vision for, so against dictators, but for the future, this was not there. Even the 6th April movement, very powerful. You know, I don't know if you saw the, the, the two programs that were done on them on, on Al Jazeera in English and in Arabic. Very, very strong. Uh, uh, vision about how do we mobilize and, and once again they were trained and we know this it started in the two in 2000 2003 with uh, uh, Serja Popovic everything which happened in in, in uh, against Milosevic and this vision planning discipline nonviolent discipline this is known these are things that are known but they were very powerful and in the program they were saying how they wanted to go and which you know everything was thought about it's it's about for example the the slogan nothing should be said against the west everything should be said against the regime it was very disciplined it was very well done now when it came to what is your vision for the future nothing nothing clear we know why we are against, we don't know what we want as the future, talking about democracy and freedom. And what happened is something that we had here in the West, but it was not only a Western understanding or a, a Western projection. Straight after uh, the first uh, 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 step in Tunisia and then in Egypt, the big question, what about the Islamist? What about the secular? And the discussion was a polarization between the secular and the Islamist. So this is the main point here today where uh, we, 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 we need to, to deal with this. Why? Because when you, you, you talk to people in the region and coming from Tunisia and Egypt, they say, oh, this is a Western business. They are looking at us as, you know, uh, Islamist against uh, secular, but in fact, it's not true. It's not coming from the West. It's also coming from the Muslim majority countries. That you have this polarization in all the discussion, and when you have this polarization in all the discussion, this is what I call the contemporary crisis in the Arab mind and in the Muslim mind. Is the way you portray the whole political discussion and economic discussion in the Muslim majority countries now is to to have this discussion between the secular and the Islamist and to take it as the big question for now and for the future. And ending by asking ourselves, what about the democratic process? What about transparency? What about uh, uh, representation within the country? But if you listen to the, the deep discussion that we have now, and that we had, because it's changing, for example, in, in, uh, in Tunisia now, it's changing. But for the first months, what we had is the secular saying, you are Islamist, you are back, backward, you are imposing religion, and they were taking their legitimacy as being progressive against the religious people. And on the other side, the religious people saying, but you are westernized, you are working with the West, you have been, for some of you, supporting the dictator, Ben Ali, and now we have the religious credibility. At the end, the discourse and the political discourse in the Arab, majority, the Arab world and the Muslim majority countries is about credential. And we have the religious credential or we have the uh, progressive credential. And I think that this is where something should change in this. And this is still what we have in Egypt. The Muslim majority countries cannot evolve towards something which is truly democratic if we end up with this discussion about the secular against the Islamist and having a monolithic uh, understanding of what Islamist is, a monolithic understanding of what secular is. That's wrong. And the people who won in Tunisia were the people who said no to this polarization. Monsef Marzouki, who is now the president, from the very beginning, it's not new. He's not playing with this. And by the way, he is ethically very, very uh, uh, strong. This is someone who, for whom I have great respect. Why? Because he was working for human rights for years. And from the very beginning, he was saying to the uh, fundamental, uh, the, 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 the secular fundamentalists, he was telling them, you are, not, you are not in touch with the country. There is only one way to deal with our country is you might be right, but you need to work with the Islamists that are open for the dialogue. So he wanted this link to happen. And he was the second as the political party. He was elected uh, uh, then as uh, the, uh, the president. And in the Islamist, there is something that we have to stop now, is to what we have been uh, sell for, uh, 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 sold for for a year is 
you have only one choice, the dictators or the Islamists, and the Islamists are all dangerous. <laughs> this attitude towards the Islamists is completely wrong, and now we understand that there are trends within Islamists. You have the reformists, you have the legalists, and even among the reformists, if someone is talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, in Egypt, thinking that today it's one organization with one vision, that's completely wrong. It exploded under the pressure of the demonstrations in Egypt. The young generation asking the, 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 the elder generation, we have to go to Midan al Tahrir. And the elders say, no, we have to wait. And they waited till two days before it happened. So this was an explosion. Why? Because the young generation is closer to the secular opposition and the young who are against the, 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 the dictator, who were against the dictator, than towards the, the only the Salafi. And now you have another trend, which is we, we were uh, uh, understanding in the West that the Salafi, which are the literalists, uh, were supporting the Ikhwan. In fact, it's a very, very strong uh, ideological competition between the literalists and the Ikhwan, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. I think that if we, 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 we don't understand this, if we don't understand that uh, the Islamists, there is a wide range. It's not only the radicals, it's not only the radicalists, uh, the radicals, but it's also something which is the reformists, and within the reformists, many visions. For years, that's true, they were refusing the concept of democracy. Some now are saying democracy is not a, and the first, by the way, who said that I don't have a problem with democracy is Rashid Ghannouchi, who is the president of the, the Nahda now in, in Tunisia. So the point is that we have a diversity of uh, uh, Islamist attitudes, a political uh, stance, and we have a, 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 a wide range of secular attitudes. Some are very much against anything which has to do with the religious uh, uh, reference and others are saying we have no choice but we deal to deal with them. So my main point here is this polarization that was uh, uh, the reality in Tunisia and still is the reality in Egypt. Uh, there is only one way towards democracy in these countries is to go beyond that, is to go beyond this polarization and to come to policies of political vision. And I would say that this is why I'm saying in, in Tunisia we see that they are starting to come with OK, what about our economic policy? What about education? What about women in the country? They, are, they now start to speak about politics and not about this only ideological clash that was the reality just after the first, uh, uh, um, the first uh, election even and the first uh, prizing in, in Tunisia. In Egypt today, we are still within this discussion. And you can see now that uh, why I'm worried because uh, uh, we have now uh, people pushing. It's pushed from within and pushed from abroad in Egypt, the Salafi movement, the more literalists. And I wrote an article uh, when I was much criticized by saying if you uh, try to understand what is happening with the literalists in Egypt, you understand that there are internal dynamics, but you have also people supporting from them from outside. And the first country to support one trend of the Salafi is Saudi Arabia pushing them. So it was also to put the Muslim Brotherhood into a situation where they are in between the literalists on the, one, on the one hand and the army on the other hand. And there is today no real uh, future in Egypt if you don't deal with the army. So the people who are in, the, in Midan al-Tahrir asking for the army to leave are people who are understanding that it's critical now. It's a critical time where the army is still uh, taking over and deciding on the future of, of, uh, uh, of Egypt. So my main point here is for us, when we try to understand, if we keep on repeating that uh, all the Islamists are the same and bad and we don't talk, and we don't talk to the more pragmatic, it's not going to work. And it's not, in fact, the reality now. The American government and uh, European governments now are dealing with Islamists and they are trying to find uh, an agreement or to, to get a better understanding. And this is the way forward. Now, uh, um, the second thing which is still very important beyond uh, these two countries is what is going to happen in Syria and what is going to happen uh, still in Yemen and, as I said, in Bahrain in the petrol monarchy. I don't see for now anything that could happen in the petrol monarchies. I think that they are stable and they are protected at the same time. 
something which is quite interesting, and we were talking about this before, is the Moroccan example, preemptive policy to avoid demonstrations and to have controlled reform. I was told before the election who was going to win the election, which is good. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but this is also the reality. You understand that it's under control. We prefer to have them with us, then you control them and you know how to deal with them with uh, uh, some room for freedom, but not too much. So, uh, but we also have to be uh, aware that there are limitations in the whole process, but this is where you avoid the demonstration. My conclusion now, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I understand that uh, uh, I'm just uh, uh, talking about a few points, and, and it's just to open the floor uh, for discussion, but, uh, uh, and it's too short to be uh, uh, exhaustive. But I would say that uh, if I look at what is happening now with what we call uh, uh, the ARP Spring, and here it was called the ARP Awakening, which is the word I use, is one, we really have beyond the only discussion on the democratic process to connect democracy and the political system with the economic stability. There will be no democracy without economic stability. And if we are not ready to talk about this, it's not going to work. And the people who are understanding this, and, and we may have to talk about it later, uh, if you listen to uh, the way, for example, the Turkish government is entering into the discussion, is not only to talk about it, it did, he did it, for example, he, when he visited uh, the president, the prime minister Erdogan, when he visited Egypt talking uh, in such a way about, you know, the secular system that we have to deal with, uh, we don't have to be scared of the secular system. This was a symbolic take. He was talking to two kind of people, his own people and the Arab world at the same time, saying we don't have, but he was not only coming with a political understanding, he was coming with a, a, a take on the economic stability. He was dealing with this. And by the way, it's quite important. Remember then when uh, the President Barack Obama was talking, the second talk he gave about the situation after the revolution, half of the, half of the talk was about the economic factors. It was also about the World Bank, about the IMF, how we have to deal to put money in the whole process. And they are now putting money much more, and that's quite strange, much more than the Europeans. It's, if you look at what happened in Tunisia, and how much the Americans were involved from the very beginning, much more than the European countries, you ask yourself, it's quite strange, where were the French? And in fact, after this, we had a deal. We were in Tunisia, we were in Egypt. You will do the job first, first, only first, in Libya. Anyway, that's uh, a hypothesis. Uh, the second point is uh, also to take into account, as I said, the new actors. And once again, the economic stability would have to do with the Chinese presence, which is critical today, and it's known. And uh, it's connected, and it should be connected, as I said, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but not only. The Chinese presence in Africa, in the Middle East, with the Indian presence, the Russian presence, the South African presence is shifting towards East. And this is something which is of concern, but we have to take this into account. And I, I would say that if you understand the Iranian policy, the Syrian policy just before, and now it's going also to be on the same tracks, and what is happening with the vision that we, if you listen to some of the Islamist voices about what they are saying in the future, they understand that they might have to have new relationship with China and understand that this is going to counterbalance the, uh, the, the Western influence. And this is something which is important. The, uh, so having said that, it's of course the geostrategic dimension. So I wouldn't just talk about democracy in a way which is very uh, a narrow uh, understanding. And uh, the, 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 the fourth point, uh, as I said, that we have to discuss when it comes to the Middle East is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what is happening and what is not happening, in fact. I don't think that we can talk about the peace process today. I think that the situation is very, very worrying for the Palestinians. That's the reality. This is the way I see it. And the last uh, challenge that uh, we will all have to deal with in the very near future, but of course is one of the main challenges for the Muslim majority countries today, is the relationship between Sunni and Shia. It's, it's critical. It's really central 
for the relationship. Remember, in the past, the unifying factor in the Muslim majority countries was, for example, the opposition to uh, Israel. It was all the Arab and the Sunni and Shia were together. It's, this is, if you listen to the voices now, it's to say who are the most, more effective in resisting Israel today? It's not the Sunni, it's the Shia. It's Iran, strong, and, and, and you can understand that Ahmadinejad, when he speaks the way he speaks about Israel, is not only a political discourse, it's a symbolic discourse. He's trying to get his people, he's gathering, he's working on psychology. And once again, I said it when we were uh, eating right now, you can't understand the symbolic presence of the, pre the Prime Minister Erdogan in the Arab world if you don't get it. That it started when he stood up in Davos saying to the, 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 the Israeli president, I'm not going to accept what you are doing in, uh, in Gaza. And then he asked for apology when uh, they killed the people in the flotilla. The symbolic dimension here is very important. And today, the symbolic resistance or the resistance on the ground and the symbolic uh, credential that uh, is uh, 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 used now by uh, countries is very much on the side of the Shia. Hezbollah is a, 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 a Shia uh, uh, organization and they are with Iran, with what is happening in Syria, uh, at the middle of this fracture between the Sunni. So what was yesterday a unifying force mm -hmm. is today revealing fractures within the society and is going to have a great impact on the Middle East in the future. Thank you.